episode 116, The Paradox. Welcome to The Paradox with your attending, Dr. Eric Larson. He is a practicing anesthesiologist and clinical assistant professor at Michigan State University College of Human Medicine. Listen in as he takes you behind the scenes of what practicing medicine in today's ever-changing world is like with another doctor. The Paradox is a fun and accidentally informative show for physicians, patients, or anyone who has ever found themselves in a waiting room. the Paradox. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Larson. Thank you for joining me as we explore the U.S. medical system in a fun and informative format through expert analysis. Today's expert is Kevin McKernan. He is CSO and founder of Medicinal Genomics and has extensive knowledge and expertise in PCR testing. As you know, PCR testing has been at the forefront of the SARS-CoV-2 or or COVID-19 pandemic that we found ourselves in over a year now. And there's a lot of terminology that's used that's thrown around, cycle times, QC, false positives, false negatives, and it's really complicated to try and find out what the truth is and what is important. And so that's why I brought Kevin on because he has, as I mentioned, a lot of knowledge in PCRs, and I think you'll find this a really fascinating discussion. We're going to get into some technical stuff, but things that I think you can follow. I mean, frankly, if I can follow it, I think you can follow just fine. But before we dive into today's episode, I want to share a great opportunity brought to you by my friend Jimmy Turner over at The Physician Philosopher. This is for all the physicians out there who are trying to find balance but are overwhelmed by the daily to-do list and all the responsibilities as partners, parents, and physicians. Or maybe you are doing okay, but you want to be doing great. Does this sound like you? If so, then the Alpha Coaching Experience is the answer you've been looking for. This 12-week coaching program includes weekly group coaching and one-on-one coaching sessions, plus a course library full of self-coaching tools. It's one of the only programs with doctors coaching doctors. So if you're looking to reduce your burnout, improve your satisfaction in life, and create a life you love and deserve, don't wait. Spring enrollment is on sale now. The doors for Alpha Coaching close on February 22nd at midnight. For more information, go to drpodcastnetworks.com slash alpha. That's drpodcastnetwork.com slash alpha. As a reminder, you can go to theparadox.com slash 116. There you can find show notes to today's episode, we referenced a couple episodes from previous times, uh, some studies and JAMA. Also, for those of you who have not yet subscribed to the show, please click the subscribe button in your favorite podcast player. That way you don't miss any exciting episodes as they come out. It has been weekly all this year. I intend to be keeping that schedule for the rest of the year, which I credit to the Doctor Podcast Network for helping me stay on schedule and providing logistical support. You can check them out at drpodcastnetwork.com. Also, to all the patrons at patreon.com slash theparadox, there you can become a monthly supporter for the show for just as little as $2 a month. It provides the financial support to help the production and promotion of the show. And I'm tremendously thankful to all of you who leave reviews at five-star reviews so far and written reviews on whatever podcast player you're using and also recommending it to your friends and family. But without further ado, Kevin McKernan and PCR testing for COVID-19. Enjoy. Hey, I'm here with my new friend, Kevin McNernan. Kevin's a CSO and founder of Medicinal Genomics. He has a BS in biology, a focus on cloning, expressing norepinephrine transports from Emory University. But since then, he's done a lot of work in PCR and testing. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. Uh, your company does a lot of things in testing, and so we're going to talk about PCR, which suddenly everyone uh, it's become sort of a household name for whether you're in science or not. Thanks for joining the show. It is. I don't know whether it's become a dirty name or a good one <laughs> as of late. So. Well, right. And I think that's a good point. I, I, you know, like most things with the, with the SARS-CoV-2, I think, you know, we're, things become sort of, you know, social distancing. No, that, never, that term didn't exist. I mean, there are lots of, lots of things to add to the vocabulary. It's like urban, uh, an urban dictionary in some ways, right? That yeah. comes up. Yeah, it's true. Well, let's talk about PCR and PCR is short for preliminary uh, chain reaction, which is a test. And so why don't you just give us a background of what a PCR is uh, for both our clinical clinical and non-clinical friends? So it's a it's a very sensitive test that amplifies either DNA or RNA. And it can it's sensitive down to a single molecule. So uh, it can pick up 
Uh, this virus, when it's mid-infection, when it's pre-symptomatic, and even probably 70 to 90 days after uh, your symptoms have subsided. Uh, so it's, it's very good at tracking down where this virus is, but also where it was uh, in many ways. And I think, I think that's where a lot of the um, confusion comes about in, a lot, in the discussions about false positives is, is uh, you know, what is a PCR false positive? Is it picking up the wrong virus? I, I don't think that's happening very much, actually. I think that most of the PCR tests out there are really specific to the, the virus at hand. There's, there's a couple early ones that weren't as specific, but most of that's been addressed since then. I think the real challenge with PCR is that it's not necessarily predictive for who is infectious. It can tell you if you are infected or were infected but it doesn't tell you if you have live virus that is viable and transmissible to another person. Um, and so um, it's, it's been used as a pandemic tool to, to track this because of its sensitivity. Uh, the FDA has kind of held that bar on sensitivity against all tests. And it's been very difficult for other tests, particularly home tests to get cleared because they're not as sensitive as PCR. And I think that's actually a real shame because I think the home tests would really radically change the course of this. It's much, it's much easier to be taking tests at home than to be centralizing all these people into lines at testing centers where there's a chance of, uh, of actually moving infections around in line. So yes, PCR is a very sensitive test that measures the virus. It, it, since it's measuring RNA, it is not measuring the protein code. It's not measuring the spike protein. So it can't really discern whether the virus is fully intact. It can just tell you that you had a piece of RNA highly similar to SARS-CoV-2 uh, in your body. And so the RNA codes for about 1,200 proteins, I think, in the... Oh, no, it's it's 30,000 bases long. Okay. And I think the number of proteins it has, it's a very interesting virus in that it expresses a very long polypeptide that then gets cleaved into pieces. And I think it's more like 14 or so. I could have that wrong. It might be up worse to 30, but I don't think it's that, I don't think it's that long or that it's not 1200. There's actually like nine pieces of this genome that get highly expressed once it's in your cells. They're called subgenomic RNAs and it makes a lot of those. And many people may have heard of one called the N gene. That one's the most expressed one. And that's the one that I tend to target a lot for, for these tests as they go after to see how much of that N gene is made. The other gene a lot of people hear about is the spike protein. That's one that the vaccines actually intend to express. They uh, they have about, I think the Pfizer vaccine is 4,200 bases long, and it, it's expressing mostly parts of the spike protein with a couple other accessory peptides in there. And that's meant to trigger your immune system to get sensitized to the spike protein. When it comes to the testing, kind of going off in different directions here, but let's go ba back to PCR. So I my sort of simple, simplified way of thinking about the PCR is essentially it's a way of magnifying a uh, presence of some sort of the RNA or the DNA that's present, right? So we have a very small sample, like you said, we have a molecule. Ordinarily, you can't detect a molecule of anything with any sort of test, but the PCR by various, we'll just say means through various cycles can continue to amplify what you're looking for. And so hopefully by a certain point, uh, it whatever you're looking for expresses itself on your test. Is that kind of a Accurate way that, yeah, that, that's correct. And they, this is, um, and your statement about single molecules was true for a very, very long time. Recently, they have come out with single molecule sequencer. They're probably not best fit for this purpose, just due to expense and portability and all those things. But those are, I think you'll see more of those. There are things called Oxford Nanopore and, and Pacific Bioscience sequencers, which can now sequence single molecules. It's an absolute revolution in the field. And they're getting deployed in the sequencing side of tracking the pandemic, but they're more expensive. And what people use to track so millions and millions of tests is, is PCR because it's so cheap and small and it is very sensitive and it picks up these, these single molecules, but it amplifies them in order to see them. It doesn't read the single molecules directly. It makes Xerox copies of them over and over again. So there's enough of them that they can cheaply track them with fluorescence. Uh, and they look for a fluorescent signal to build up over time throughout a PCR reaction. And this is where that, that cycle threshold number has come into place, is that's the number of duplication events, how many times you ran the Xerox machine before the fluorescence reached a particular threshold. And that threshold is something that the, the labs can change a little bit. There's, a, there's sort of a background threshold they can adjust a little bit. And then there's also how many cycles do they deem to be a positive event. It's usually around 37 in most labs, but I think that's created a lot of confusion on the internet, actually. You'll hear people complaining about tests that go out to 40 or 45 cycles, but people usually aren't calling out at 40. They're running their camera out 40 cycles because they need to be able to see a few cycles past where they actually call 
the point at which the peak comes above threshold. So don't get too distracted by that. I mean, when you do see tests that say 45 cycles, it's a sign they had to run more cycles to see some of the virus come up. And that's usually a, a red flag that the test is a little bit compromised compared to others. But it's very rarely the case that the labs are calling like at 42 or 43. They're almost always calling below 38. But even at 38, there's many publications that will show you that very little of that virus is actually replication competent. It can't culture itself in, in Vero cells, which is the, the kind of the standard people use is they put these monkey kidney cells into Petri dishes and see if the virus can actually replicate there. And it's very rare you see anything after cycle 33. I want to be careful in talking about these cycle numbers is that all the tests are need to, a 33 in one test isn't identical to a 33 in another. So there's sure. a calibration between them, but they may, they probably only shift a couple cycles between the different tests. So uh, it's, we can't you take this universal 33 number and throw it across the globe. That's what a lot of people are asking the, the World Health Organization to do, but they've wisely stepped away from that saying that's, that's a little risky. Look at your test sp uh, specifics at the FDA and under the, the, the emergency youth use authorization documents to know where your limit of detection is. Your limit of detection is the point at which your assay can no longer pick up molecules. And it's usually the tests are about five to 50 molecule sensitive for picking up RNA viruses. Uh, they don't get all the way down to a single molecule for a host of reasons, but there are highly specialized DNA amplification tools that can pick up single molecules. They're just not employed on this and they're perhaps a little bit oversensitive for the needs. But if there are, I'd say if you're on those swabs that you take, the entire swab that goes in your nose or in your mouth doesn't end up in your PCR test. Probably a 50th of it ends up in the PCR test. So. If you have maybe 500 molecules on that swab, the test will pick it up late at 37. If uh, it's below that, they may not see it. But that is probably the biggest variance we have in all of PCR right now is the swab. Uh, it can vary a thousand to 10,000 fold in how much comes out, which means interpreting the PCR results. It's really dependent on knowing how much you got out of that swab. The tests here in the States, at least the ones from the CDC, have a very important internal control that measures a human gene in the process. So they can calibrate how well did your swab work? If, if nothing comes off, if you don't see any human gene signal, you know the swab just missed and it's, it's a dud. But if you see a, very, a high amount of that human DNA, human RNA, you will know that you got a very good sampling and that you might need to discount the viral load a little bit. I don't think a lot of that normalization is happening right now in the field. They're just looking, is a human gene there or not? If it's not there, they it's, a non, it's basically a non-informative test and they try to repeat it. And if it's there, they'll, they'll move on to calling whether it's, you know, hopefully below 37. But it's, it's really important to have those internal controls. They're not present in all the kits. In fact, in Europe, there's one kit that I've been quite outspoken about people changing it is that they uh, they don't have that internal control. And it makes it very difficult for them to put a, C a CT cutoff for who's in fact has viable virus and who doesn't, because I think that's critically important for the patients to know, the doctors to know, mainly because uh, in many jurisdictions, we're doing these tests without physicians involved. So we're, we're calling medical cases kind of blindly off of a test, an amplification test that's easy to contaminate. And without symptoms, uh, I think calling medical cases and quarantining people sort of crosses some ethical lines and that there should be a secondary test or something else to confirm the event. That's a long-winded way of saying that there's a lot of complexity in how we call these PCR tests, and I wish more physicians were involved. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. So I guess, you know, to summarize things, you'd say that there are cycle times on average, once you hit below 33 on average... Uh, you're getting probably a you're you're probably getting a sample that doesn't contain vi viable virus, one that's actually active within the the host, probably. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry, I meant to, it's it's after 33. The, the right. scale is inverse. So the more yeah, the more cycles you need, the less initial material you had. So if your sample amplifies in 20 cycles, you had a ton of RNA to start with because your Xerox machine only needed to run 20 times to make it come above sure. signal. If you have to go 40 times you're having to run that Xerox machine so many times that you're just picking up noise. One way of, of estimating the magnitude of this event, every cycle is a doubling. So you can put two to the power of the number of cycles that you do, and that gives you kind of a sense of how many times you had to amplify it. So two to the 30th power is a very large number. Um, but about every 3.3 cycles is a tenfold difference. So a, a 30 versus a 33 is like a tenfold difference in the amount of RNA. Um, that's kind of a, a general 
um, guideline on on uh, on what these numbers mean. Right. Basically, if you have a low cycle threshold, you're saying that the likelihood of you getting a positive culture, not that people culture uh, very often respiratory things, that you're, it's you're a little right. higher, right? Yeah. That, yeah, it's much higher. In fact, a good paper for this is from Rita Jafar uh, out of France. And and you're right, people can't culture these things on every test because it, one, the cultures take a long time and nobody likes to have a, a factory <laughs> yeah. of replicating, right? It'd just be a, it'd be a hot zone. So they do it once to calibrate the test and then they never do it again. <laughs> but the calibration is really important. I mean, we and all PCR tests, that's the gold standard is you want to have the CT values calibrated back to replication competent organisms. Otherwise you're, you, you're kind of have a number in space and you don't really know what it means and, and whether it really guides any, um, you know, clinical outcomes. Right. So what's the term CQ? I hear, I see that oftentimes thrown about as well. What's the difference in that in CT? So I'm glad you brought that up because CQ is actually the more proper term according to okay. the MIQE guidelines. Uh, Stephen Buston authored that paper, and but they, they get used interchangeably with CT, and it's an artifact of early in the PCR days, there were some patents on different techniques, and of course, people had to name things differently to try and dance around <laughs> them, but cycle threshold and cycle quantification are interchangeable terms. Okay. It's very similar to EKG and ECG, right? It depends if you want to use the German yes, spelling. Yeah, or not. there you go. <laughs> Right, right. And so I think, you know, important thing you mentioned is the logarithmic nature of it, the, sort of the mathematics of it all. How many times you press the zoom button on your computer to get focus in on some of your, your photo, the more time you have to do it, obviously, the smaller it is, whatever you're looking at, right? And so, exactly. right. And so, uh, but it is, it's a doubling. And so what, two to the third, third, every three cycles, about eight, right? So that's why it's about, is that kind of how you yeah, get to sort yeah. of like almost logarithmic, right? Every yeah, three. Yeah, yeah. So it's three point three yeah, technically right. is a is a ten log. So we go in units of three point three on the on the two log <laughs> sure. scale. But um, uh, and so then I, you know, one of the things I saw earlier on is um, you'll see it. You'll see it's a nice downward slope. I think it's downward slope of of um, amount of virus based on your uh, cycle threshold. Or but that's always graphed in logarithmic fashion. So it looks like a kind of a nice smooth line that's fairly flat. And then when you see it, when it's actually not flat, it's, you see a massive spike in virus at like it, but it, at one point and really not much after that. I mean, if that makes sense. Like, well, are you referring to the sort of the course of the viral load in the patient? Yeah, over exactly. Time? Yeah. So you'll see, you'll see, you know, threshold yeah, like, tail. Right. Right and, and even early a little bit, but not quite as much, but definitely more long tail than early that, yeah, it's, there's kurtosis in the tail. And, and that's actually what drives us nuts, is, is that the front end of the curve is really steep. It replicates very quickly upon infection. And that's actually an important piece of information. If we were actually testing at two different time points with PCR, we would know that you're in the front end or the back end of the infection because it grows so quickly in the front end and it clears so slowly in the back end that you would see a very subtle change in the CT value 24 hours apart if you're clearing the infection and you'd see a rapid change and in, in PCR lingo, you'd see a, actually a decrease in the CT value because lower CTs mean there's more virus. So you would see the, the, the number go, go down on the scale on the front end, and you'd see it actually go up on the scale out toward 40 on the tail end. And, and if we had the, um, the wherewithal to, to test twice less people, we would actually know whether you're pre-symptomatic or whether you're clearing this. And I actually think that's the real key to opening up society is that because I, I should point your, your audience to a paper that describes some of this. It's called Liotti, L-I-O-T-T-I. It's in JAMA. And what they do is they measure the PCR course of, inf of infection, and they show that people are infectious for about seven days, and they show that they're PCR positive. One patient out there was out to 77 days, but it was 172 patients in that study, and I think it was about 46 or 47 days uh, on average, they were PCR positive. So your PCR positive, if you're PCR positive for 47 days and you're only infectious for seven days, there's a lot of quarantine potential of people who aren't really infectious. And I think that's the problem that, that occurs when you run into a, a seasonality like this, you get into the winter time and suddenly you get lots of people that are positive and everyone freaks out on, on the news, but we don't really have good time resolution on how many of those are recovering and how many of those are pre-symptomatic and infectious. This is where I think a lot of those rapid antigen tests can really help out because they, they're, they're much less sensitive and they're, they're looking for spike protein. So they're much more reflective of the patients that are truly infectious. It'd almost be better if we use those to confirm PCR yeah. <laughs> or maybe just started when you go into asymptomatic populations, maybe that's the better tool because one, it's cheaper. It's a little bit more portable 
and it's not going to flag as many people that had the virus a few weeks ago. And then suddenly you contact trace map that entire family unnecessarily and sweep in a lot more of this testing. I don't think there's a lot of financial motivation, unfortunately, to switch just because the, the contact tracing is in fact a, a testing vacuum. It brings in a lot more samples. And so when, when the positivity goes up, the testing labs get flooded and the contact tracing is, is uh, they, they like positivity because it brings in more of the family members. If you had a test that actually cut that off, it would probably lower revenues for them. There's a little bit of, I think, a battle in the marketplace right now with PCR versus rat testing. And you can see a lot of those fights on Twitter. But uh, I personally think the tracking the infectious folks are mo is most important because there is an impact on hospital care if everyone's suddenly positive, but they're asymptomatic or they, it's, they're positive because they had it a few weeks ago. You start to lose, if not the nurses, you lose some of their family members and their kids. And there's all types of displacement for people trying to staff the hospitals when the tests are overly sensitive and, and picking up past infections. Yeah, no question. And, I, and we'll see it in surgery because we require PCR tests before every surgery within, I think it's like 72 oh, wow. hours for elective surgery. And so- there are a number of people who that time that time is a real problem yeah. because uh, you, what do you do in those three days while you're waiting? You can't live in a bubble. Well, no, I mean, I, I so this this sort of exposes the problem with any of these sorts of regimens that you sort of processes you put into place, right? So we'll have people have to have a test within three three days, seventy two hours. If it's positive, their case gets canceled. If and let's say they're asymptomatic, their case is canceled for ten days and they you know reschedule. If it's negative, we just go ahead and go and. And then there's, of course, on the day of surgery, you know, are you asymptomatic? Do you not have you know, symptoms of, you know, respiratory problems? If not, then we just go ahead and go. Now, you could argue we could, you could be infectious during that period. I mean, they're all, you can never catch someone perfectly if you're not testing everybody yeah. every day, right? And so there's always a risk. I guess you'd argue that, well, you're catching some people. But to your point, we don't really know when people are infectious. And this is the problem because I think fundamentally PCR as it's used now is a qualitative versus a quantitative test, right? You're right. Yeah. These got rushed out under qualitative guidelines and we're, lo we're looking to do quantitative assessments with it. And, and that is, that is part of the challenge is a lot of people are, and I, I've been pushing to get the, the quantitative information out. Cause I think that's the only way to, to answer that question is to look at CT values and know that, all right, if, if you have a patient that needs a surgery, like an, a, an appendectomy or something, it's kind of urgent. You know, if the CT values have a 37, that's probably safe to continue. You're probably going to do it anyway with an appendectomy. Maybe that's a bad example. It's true. I actually have already done. I have done that specific case. Actually, yeah, yeah. So uh, bad example, but you know something else that may be maybe not as urgent, but you know you, you may not need to yeah. hold it up for for a 35 or a 37 C CQ. Now, do, do you have to test your staff as well? Do they get do they get dinged by these? The answer is no. What we do is we survey people. So we we do all the things. Uh, check temperature. Are you symptomatic? If you're not, are you have you had people who have exhibited symptoms that you're living with who've had positive tests, those sorts of yeah, things, then okay. you get yourself tested. A lot of my partners and lots of people I know in the nursing staff have been tested at some point or another, just because, you know, nowadays you can't get a cold and just show up to work. And now you get a cold, it's like, well, it might be SARS-CoV-2, it might have COVID-19, so I bet I've got to get a PCR test, yeah. right? And so that, so, and then you're waiting for the results before you can come in. So we've had a lot of people who have been sidelined for a day or so. I mean, our turnaround's usually pretty fast except when it got really, really busy. And then it was, then we're having uh, delays of five days getting results back, which makes it pretty much clinically useless. Yeah, because you can't, uh, by the time you yeah. get the answer back, you, you don't know what's happened. Yeah, we, we experienced that as well. In We're in more of an agricultural testing arena and uh, we're often put up against culture. I mean, in the culturing these things and some of the, the yeast and molds can take five days to 10 days to grow. And so by the time you actually get an answer, you've got a question, what's now growing on the product after I got the test back? Right. You know, so there's that, that time, the time delay is a real issue. And it's, it's really not an artifact of PCR. It's an artifact of centralizing the PCR because you can get an answer from PCR in, in an hour. I, I've seen some people do it in, in 20 minutes with some really you know, fast cyclers, but trying to get all those swabs coordinated and centralized in a few laboratories and run is I think where, where uh, the time, these time dilations are occurring. Um, the rat tests offered, you know, they can do this in 20 minutes and then we're portable than PCR, but there are tools out there that could do PCR in a more decentralized fashion. They're just not through the FDA yet. I, I think the FDA has maybe allowed one or two out the door, but there's a lot of folks banging on, banging on their door right now to try and get the, the home tests out so that 
you don't have this long wait. And then you, if they're cheap enough, you can run them twice, you know, all right, that, that if you can run them twice, you get rid of the whole false positive concern, you know, uh, cause, right. and, and you can also maybe if, if there's at least some level of quantitation on the test, you can see if the viral loads changing between the two tests and that, that can be informative as well. But I think the home test, not all of them are going to be quantitative. They're, they're mostly going to be qualitative where they're just yes, no answers. That's, that, that's still very helpful. That could still you know, tremendously screen out the number of people that are waiting around for a test. And I, and I agree, if it starts pushing beyond four or five days, it's, it's not a very useful, very practical tool because you have, what do you do in the meantime while you're waiting? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's been the problem. And I, I would even argue once you get to about three days clinically, it's, it's almost useless because you probably infected anyone you're going to infect at that point. The whole family's, you know, you've got, right. you've caused, a, you've caused a real problem. You, you're not able to adequately, it's not realistic to have in families to quarantine people for multiple times because they have kids who have, you know, come back from daycare with the runny nose. And yeah. what, I mean, what are you going to do? Uh, so it makes it real complicated. Uh, can you briefly just talk about, you know, you hear people say, well, you know, if you run a PCR long enough, you're going to get a positive right? If you run yeah. enough cycles. So is that, you, is that just briefly just kind of like noise that, that eventually just yeah, so shows up? Eventually the primers will bind to themselves. So the way, the way PCR okay. works is they have, there's usually two primers, which are about 20 letters long. And that's kind of the address for what part of the DNA you want to amplify. And those should be very specific to the virus and not have any cross reactivity to the human DNA or the human RNA. And they shouldn't cross react with themselves either. If they can bind onto each other, then you can get weird amplification signals that come out, you know, past 40. That is the case in a couple of the really, the kits that were first raced to market in Europe do have some of that capacity. And it's been document. we have a paper out that's documented about 20 different papers that show some of these primers interacting with themselves and it can decrease your sensitivity and it can also create some false positives. But you know, th those are usually things that are occurring out past 37, past your limit of detection. And most of that noise should have been screened out with the tests that have been thoroughly validated. But there, you know, there are some ex extreme examples where people report they've put Kiwis in there or some other, other, you know, some other DNA that the manufacturers never, they can't test these things against everything under the sun, right? Uh, sure. So there may be some extreme genome out there that shares some of these sequences and it tends to light up on them, not perfectly, but maybe very, very late in the, in the process. There's certainly some examples of some of the earlier tests that were amplifying in water. Uh, you know, the negative controls were lighting up too frequently, and that's a sign the test probably needs to get refactored a little bit. But I don't think that's the dominant cause of false positives. I don't think it's a, a primer issue or a, a, a sort of a, a specificity issue, like hitting the wrong stuff. I really think the predominant false positive debate that's going on is really a misunderstanding between a clinical false positive and an analytical false positive. Analytical false positives would be, okay, your primers did something like that. You know, they, they, they misbehaved, they landed on themselves, or you ran it too long and you got a signal that's late and probably analytically incorrect. I think the bigger issue is really splitting hairs between people who uh, who are on that long tail of positivity, where they, they're no longer infectious. They truly had the virus, but it was a long time ago. Uh, and there's enough remnant RNA around that you're picking them up and quarantining them. And uh, you know, many medical ethic ethicists will say, well, that's a clinical false positive because you're quarantining somebody who's not infectious. And the test is calling medical cases without medical supervision. So it needs to be held to the standard of, of a clinical false positive. So I, I think that's where most of the, the debate is probably misheard in, in the field is a lot of people just think it's, oh, they're running 45 cycles, they're, they're irresponsible. But I really don't think there's that, that much of that going on out there. It's really more of, of people just not calibrating the test to replication competent organisms. There's maybe a dozen papers out there that have done that. And I don't think that is, you don't see that in the FDA documents. The emergency youth author, authorization documents don't require that step. Most other clinical tests they do. I just think under these emergency circumstances, they cut that part out because no one really had access to the virus uh, until, until much later in the pandemic. Uh, ATCC finally got versions of the virus available for people to purchase that were attenuated, but they didn't have it early on. It was um, They were having to design these things off of a DNA sequence that was emailed to them from China. So um, it was it was kind of a race to get out the door and there were some errors on, on the front end of it. I think it's probably important to point out that when we talk about, and it's, it's, it's why the term cases is not the right. It's a bad word. Yeah. That, that, that's... It's a bad word, but maybe it's accurate. Maybe in some, you know, it, it encompasses everything of people who have at some point been positive, but doesn't necessarily mean that you are actively infectious or sick. Right. Right. And so that's the, that's the tricky thing. So 
it, would you say it's it's fairly safe to say if you have a positive PCR, you have an infect a current an infection, or you recently had one, and recently within the last couple months? Yeah, and I I guess I'd have to leave it. Uh, I defer to you on the definition of of an infection um, because yes, you, the RNA is there, uh, and, and but you know there's a lot of asymptomatic in, infection, I guess, uh, with this virus, yeah. and so some people don't even like to call cases on people that are asymptomatic because they've not presented a medical condition uh, per se, yeah. right? So there's perhaps some terminology. We, maybe we need new terminology here, which is, you know, you're RNA positive, but you may not be infect, infectious and you may not be a case yet, but we're, we're calling, calling every positive PCR right now a, a case. And I think that's where a lot of the misunderstanding is coming into play. Yeah. Well, and I, you know, when you look at HIV, we have people who have, who are considered infected with HIV and are positive, but, they don't have but their viral load is, yeah. is so massively low with medications now they're, I mean, they're asymptomatic. I mean, they're pretty much yeah. fine. Now they have, they're done that with, they're that in that condition because of medications. Uh, but uh, I think probably in some ways it's a, somewhat analogous. I mean, it I, is. Yeah. It, and, and, it's transmitted yeah. differently. So I understand there's perhaps, you know, I, yeah. I don't know at what viral load in HIV you're, you can still, uh, it's still sexually transmissible or, or transmissible through blood, but that's um, it's, it's a similar, I think a similar analogy other just it's respiratory in this case. Yeah. And I think overall, when it comes to SARS-CoV-2, it's really hard, primarily, I think, because we don't really do it with anything else, with any other, many other infectious diseases that I'm aware of, where, I mean, it's entirely possible that we have asymptomatic carriers of all sorts of things. Absolutely. Well, I mean, we know we do this, right? We yeah. absolutely know we have people who are who are, are colonized with, say, uh, strep pneumonia, and, you know, they they or strep B or something, right? And they, they walk around all the time and give other people strep. Yeah. They're, they're asymptomatic. They don't... Ha- in fact, I know someone personally, my wife, who was one of those people. My son kept getting it. And of course, you know, she's a pediatrician. She assumed for some reason that I had it and that I was the, ca- the carrier. And so she's like, we well, better make sure no one in our family has it. So we all did the big, huge, you know, throat swabs. And of course, she she cultured positive. But uh, but we know that happens. I'm sure that happens with viruses. I know I've talked to my friend who has spoken in the last episode, uh, Dr. Graham, and he said, you know, you culture any daycare kid and they're going to have a number of respiratory viruses asymptomatically. They're in their nasal pharynx. Right. And that's just and that's how they transform a lot of adenoviruses or coronaviruses. And that's just a thing. Yeah. It, it's an interesting point that that this coincided with us really turning on genomics at a population scale, you know, and, and so now we're seeing these waves for the first time and we don't know how to interpret them. Right, we, we're seeing uh, yeah. these large spikes in positivity, thinking the world's going to end. But it's like that's actually seasonality of the virus that we're watching in real time, and it may not um, perfectly translate into hospital load. Uh, I think that's something we're all we're all learning this year is is what level of PCR positivity is actually predictive of hospital overflow. Certainly, the numbers going up isn't good, but it's it doesn't necessarily translate in, into into deaths. So I, I worry that in that. We could repeat this with OC43, for instance, another coronavirus that's seasonal, that travels. It's less, it's less symptomatic than SARS, uh, than C19, right? And if we were to hunt that around, I think we could easily create a media narrative of panic tracking that around as well. Because it does take out some, it does take out some elderly, you know, it, there's some cases sure. of OC43 hitting nursing homes and having like an 8%, you know, fatality rate or something. It's, it can actually be quite high in the elderly. It's just not, you know, novel and out of China. It's been around forever and it's less severe than, than, than SARS-CoV-2. But I wonder if we had like turned our eye onto that thing with all this PCR capacity and tested the world asymptomatically, if we, we, we could have driven ourselves into a state of panic and shut down as well off of something even more benign. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the element of what you do when you do it and it makes it a lot more challenging for, for people. And the fact that it's novel, as you mentioned, makes a big uh, difference too. But I think there's a, I mean, I don't think anyone can, can credibly say that SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19 is not a real disease process. It's not really a, a pandemic. It's definitely spread over the world as people are getting infected all over the place. And it is definitely killing lots of people. Yes. The question is, you know, how do you track it? Who's at risk? How do you sort of protect people? Hey, triage. And it, it, how triage. And I think, you know, f- fundamentally, if we looked at OC43, you know, we've, again, I've discussed in my show before, probably 1870s across were from cows. We're not sure. Sometime around then is this the suspicion. And uh, it wouldn't, at that time, travel around the world as quickly just because of travel. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah know, exactly. Right? It's going to be a slow sort of burn across the world. I actually right? like that. Um, 
Sunotra Gupta has a really interesting take on this and that human immunology has vastly improved since we've become hyper-connected. And that might actually be the reason why we have, you know, longevity improvements in human lifespan is because there are no longer pockets of the world that get hit with smallpox and get wiped out, right? Because smallpox we've dealt with vaccination, but there just aren't these pockets that are, are immunonaive to particular variants or particular strains anymore because we're traveling so much, we're sharing these things around. So all of our immune systems sure. are getting, you know, hyper-stimulated to the point where uh, we don't have a you know blinded exposure, if you will. Uh, so I I found that really fascinating because it's 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 uh, it seems to resonate with with you know lifespan increases and and perhaps it, it sheds a different light on immunology. Uh, the, the concept of isolating everybody may actually bring us back to a point of having subpopulations that uh, you know forest fires that can occur because we remained outside of the germ pool for so long uh, and we hide. And then next thing you know, a real tough variant comes through and our immune system hasn't had that, that little upgrade from the most recent variant. And so you get hit with something that's much, much more distant uh, because of your isolation. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack here, I think, from a, a global immunology standpoint. Yeah, a lot we don't understand. I mean, I think, you know, there's, there are so many black boxes that exist within the SARS-CoV-2. We see young children who are essentially not susceptible to this. We don't have right. any explanation for why the young are, right? I mean, is it because they're living with coronaviruses, you know, left and right all the time? And so that provides some innate immunity to right, it, some, right. some T cell immunity. I mean, clearly you see that as you get older, you're more at risk because it's a new variant. Or I shouldn't say variant. It's a new virus entirely. Yeah. Uh, it's right. And so there are people who clearly have some sort of innate immunity. We can't, we can't explain, but, but the elderly are much more at risk because they have not seen it. I mean, you wonder at some point if it's very similar to like when OSC-743 came across, that all the young people got it. The old people, probably weren't as many old people then, probably not as many people who were obese who had higher you know, risk for things. Yeah, and metabolic disease. It knocked different. off. Yeah. Right. It just knocked off some people, and but there weren't as many people to, to maybe kill. It didn't spread as quickly, obviously, because of world travel. Anyway, uh, and then those generations, and from there on, everyone just has an endemic coronavirus, and they're just sort of they exposed to it when they're a young child, and it's not a big deal. It causes a cold. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there are many things like this that I think we don't think about. We, we know, but we don't think about sometimes. Like, for instance, if you get varicella, chicken pox when you're a kid, well, you get chicken pox, you're pretty, pretty terrible. You feel awful for a week or two or something. Super highly contagious, right? Uh, like but you can remain dormant you for a while, right? Yeah, you're, you're okay. Now, we do know about shingles and other things that can happen later, yeah. which we are associated with varicella. But if you're 50 and the first time you're exposed to varicella, it can kill you. Right. Like, I mean, there's no, right. And I think, you know, that could be a little bit of what this is. It's sort of like your you're old people with immune systems that are sort of set, cannot adapt as quickly, maybe. I don't know. I, we right. don't understand this stuff. But that it may be a lot of that, right? It's just like a, and there's nothing you can do about it, except I think a vaccination is a is a helpful thing in the sense that I'd rather have a vaccine be my first exposure to this to this uh, yeah. virus, yeah, yeah, and to get to develop an immune response, and then I'm going to experience in the wild probably a couple more times as it just keeps circulating around. Right, right. You know, my only reservations on the on the vaccines are just the speed and the QC. Right, we've got great um, sequencing being done on a lot of these coronaviruses, so we understand the variants and uh, the whole flux of them. What I'm somewhat shocked by is I'm just not seeing any sequence QC on the actual. MRNA that's in the vaccines, you know, quality control, you're saying, right? Yeah, I would love to see those sequences readily just to know, because I know from manufacturing long RNAs like that, it's not a single sequence. Uh, it's just there's error in the process of making RNA like that. And so there's going to be a mutation profile in those vaccines. Um, they might be very low percentages and small heteroplasmies, not, not maybe nothing to worry about, but it's not expensive to do anymore. With sequencing costs these days, they could be sequencing, you know, every hundredth vaccine that's given out if they wanted to, just to see, okay, what's the manufacturing QC like this? And I think they're just getting raced out the door so quickly. It's that that's not happening. There's also not a lot of liability on them. So I worry that that without the liability, there isn't a motivation to do extra QC, but um, I, I would love to have a catalog of that just to know, uh, are there particular variants that are in these vaccines that might be, you know, something we like, we, should we have a record of those, just like we have a record of the mutation of profiles moving through in, in, on the virus side, just to know what epitopes are actually getting exposed to, to, to humans. The, the main region in the spike protein that I think causes the most controversy is the Staphylococcus enterotoxin B 
domain. This is this is an SAB domain that's really hyper. Um, it, it drives it can drive cytokine storms, and this is the area they think is involved in a lot of this antibody dependent enhancement and pathogenic priming. And it's the, it's the area where they're I think they're most worried about long term effects of the vaccine. That if you get the vaccine and you see coronavirus again, a small percentage of those people have a bad response. And we don't understand it, but it's what's kind of held up. Peter Hotez was actually quite vocal about this uh, early on. Uh, he's a vaccine expert down at Baylor. That ADEs always held up other cold vaccines because they just in animal models they have a really hard time with this and they they don't understand it. But I think we want a catalog of of these things of these variants to know if any of those if if there's any rare errors in the synthesis of the vaccine that may might be in that SAB domain or other other critical parts of the protein that we we have some understanding of those too. But I agree with you in general. I like the idea of not having the whole virus in me if I'm going to first be exposed to it. I'd rather have just a small yeah. piece of it. So it's not replication competent. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. And I think this messenger RNA technology is incredibly powerful. Like it's it's clean in terms of, you know, the earlier vaccines that um, the world lived with, they had to brew these things in other organisms uh, and other yeah. cells and all types of other, like SV40 came through in one of the earlier polio vaccines, right? So there's, there's a host of complications that occur when you have to make these things in cells that just don't exist in, in mRNA vaccines. They can be incredibly clean and that they're, they're purely synthesized and we can, we can QC this thing beyond uh, our dreams that we could ever QC a, QC a vaccine before. So it's a really promising technology. I just hope we don't hit a pothole on the way because we're rushing it. And somehow it gets, it gets egg on its face. No pun intended because the flu is growing yeah, eggs. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, because of this, because they've raced it so quickly, but because I, I don't want to see that technology get bruised in the public opinion Yeah. because it's, it, it right. can really revolutionize things we're doing. Well, and, and I think, you know, with all the variants that are have that are appearing and I, I don't like saying it that way because it makes it sound like variants are a new thing with SARS-CoV-2, but it's as soon as it hits anybody, it starts mutating and there, yeah. and as, when it gets in larger populations, you're going to get more and more variants. There are, I don't know, 10,000 variants they found and only a couple of them are important enough to actually made a, Be on the radar. make note of. Yeah. Yeah. Which, you know, now there's another one in California. I just read the other day. I mean, I, I'm sure there'll be just, they're all over. So I guess the f one question is with a PCR testing, do they just look for a small sequence? Are there going to be yeah. some of these variants that potentially would, would be evade would evade the um, there the are. PCR test? You hit on a really important point because now they're now they're starting to mark you know track all the different frequencies of those variants amongst the population to know which primer pairs are in fact impacted by these. And this happened to the UK actually. They were um, using an assay known as the TAC path assay that unfortunately it was targeting the S protein and there was the the B one one seven variant happened to trip that assay up so it was it was failing. To to detect those particular viruses. Now, for this reason, we, we prefer to have three, multiple different targets in these tests. If we just target sure. one region, that can happen and you can have blanks and not know about it for a long period of time. What they do is they usually target the S gene, sometimes the N gene, sometimes the E gene, sometimes ORF1AB. Ideally, you want three of these uh, because it's mutating at such a rate that you need to have at least two of them light up and you can afford for one of them to fall through. Uh, and that's kind of what they've resorted to in the UK. However, what you'll notice is when the summer comes around, the assays start to drop out anyway. Uh, only the really only like the N gene and a couple of the really highly expressed genes stick around for the summer. And so you start to see in patients uh, the number of patients that are testing positive for all three genes will start to decay in the spring down to two genes, then down to one gene, then down to zero. Uh, as you come into the summertime uh, seasonality of it. So uh, I, I do think it's important that there's at least three of them and that they should be spread out all over the virus's genome because there is differential RNA expression on, on one side of the genome versus the other. And if you only put them on one side, you might be measuring non-replication competent virus. If you just measure the, the three, for instance, the three prime end of the, of the virus sticks around the longest and uh, you can get signal there and not necessarily have replication competent virus. And you mentioned earlier about the antigen tests at home. Uh, my understanding, and I don't, you probably know the answer to this, is that actually antigen testing for home use, meaning like the, I don't know, spit in a cup sort of, you know, antigen test that people could potentially do, or their own nasal swab, I suppose, that that was that technology was actually present right at right at the beginning. We're talking March or April of of 2019, and that it was uh, that technology was sort of squashed by the FDA and the CDC because it wasn't sensitive enough, and they said we don't want, we're not going to allow this sort of thing onto the market because. Yes. We want to have trained professionals to to do it. And it probably put it to the point where because of the centralization, as you were talking about earlier with the, the testing, where they're just, you know, 
much like we have problems with the vaccination distribution because it's all somewhat centralized, partly because it's just the nature of the vaccine where it has to be in those co- yeah. freezers and stuff like yeah. that. But that it sort of made it a lot harder to get any sort of handle on where the virus was and how prevalent it was. Yeah, that, that's, that's true. It, it, one, it had, had a time effect is when you centralize them, it turns into a three or four day process as opposed to getting an answer that day in your house. And and I, I actually think there's a risk in, in the more you centralize, the more you're concentrating people who think they have the virus with people who have it. And so you, you I mean, I know here in Mass, they I remember going to one of the testing centers and they had all of us line up in the same line, asymptomatic and symptomatic in the same line. And they didn't triage them like and, and test the symptomatics first. So one o'clock rolled around and they said, we're closing up for the day. We don't test after one o'clock. And it's like, everyone go home. It's like, well, you, you could have run all the symptomatic people in the morning and, and, <laughs> and, and not, you know, just simple things like that, that I, I think get, you know, that can increase the risk of spreading this by, by, by centralizing it. So, and you're right, they were, the technologies were available and the FDA in general, they get very nervous at directed consumer testing. Uh, and they, they, I think they just were afraid to let out, let that out of the gate, but I think it would have helped tremendously in the pandemic had they done so. There would have been less quarantine going on and probably less people congregating at, at um, you know, clinics and, and, and hospitals where, you're, you know, if, if you're in, if you go to the hospital, it's, if there are higher rates of infection in hospitals because you got a lot of sick people there. So, right, it's, turns it's, out, uh, not necessarily the best place to be waiting around for a test. So, the remote clinics are very helpful, but uh, you know, I've a lot of these things got thrown up in parking lots, and I've always wondered about the, you know, the the validity of those uh, of the audit trail of your sample through those labs to reports back. I mean, when you centralize yeah. like this, it's very difficult to audit those databases, and there's privacy issues. We don't know who's these are going to turn into uh, DNA banks or, you know, what, what, what information is getting relayed where. So a lot of HIPAA got thrown out the window this year. And, you know, that, that's, I, I know when I've been tested before, I've gotten calls from my department of health here in town, kind of harassing us not to go out. And I was like, how'd you get the information? How'd you even know that I was tested? Yeah. But right. um, that, 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 so that sort of thing. I, I think there are some societal things that would like privacy in general would be better if it were at home. Sure. And, and I yeah. think that would, that would uh, appease many more of the, the folks who are worried about the civil liberties in this. Yeah. Well, longtime listeners will recognize and I'll make sure I link to it that our, my HIPAA episode I did where basically HIPAA does everything but protect your privacy. Uh, <laughs> the whole point is, is actually information sharing with people who want to purchase it, which is actually just makes it more streamlined and, and, and simpler for them, uh, whether it's... Yeah. Uh, scientists, laboratories, or whatever. And I think a lot of the problem with the, that the FDA is driven a lot by um, the the professional societies and by the hospitals too. So the hospitals obviously want to capture all the, those lab charges uh, that you know, yeah. is going to happen for testing. And also physicians too, as physicians are really hesitant to allow people to test anything. It, it's, you know, if you're old enough, you know that you couldn't actually buy an over-the-counter pregnancy test until, yeah. you know, relatively modern history, right? Because you feel that, like, well, I don't know if you pee. Can you tell if that's a minus sign or a plus sign? Yeah. Right? I mean, it, right? And so, so those things existed, and so you can see why there's there is definitely a bias towards preventing people from taking care of you know the test their own testing. Well, you bring up an important point that that regulation actually inflates the cost tremendously. Uh, yeah, sure. So the PCR tests here are like three hundred thirty dollars, and and those tests, same type of tests, run in a market that isn't clinically regulated like this, are like five dollars. Uh, sure. You know, and in fact, I know people who run PCR at these volumes and the cost when you get into it of, of the enzyme and everything else, it gets down below a dollar when you start going up to these scales. There's a massive upcharge for the CLIA overhead that probably brings it up to about 50 bucks at scale. I think if you go to like one of the larger labs in the country is the Broad and they're probably somewhere between 40 and 50 bucks a test. And then and when you get to some of these more remote clinics and you're only doing one by ones, you're not bringing in hundreds of samples in every given batch and the batch size is individualized, they, they go up to 150 to $300 a test. And none of that is really PCR costs. That's, I think, all regulatory costs. Uh, and sure. yeah, so yeah. It, it, that's, that's one downside of, of hyper-regulation is that it does tend to drive the costs up. And I'm not certain you get the quality, the do, you know, quality per dollar spent is not, is not necessarily great money spent there. Yeah, they may bring in some more oversight and some more with some regulation. You might get you know some some more check boxes marked, but you're going to pay exponentially for it. Yeah, I mean, you could argue really. I guess we don't know the answer as far as when you're infectious. How much viral load do you have to have to be spreading it? We we can guess. Yeah. You know, if you have a lot, you're more it's, likely to. I've seen papers that suggest it's over. You know, you need to have over ten to the sixth. You know, a million copies per swab, uh, and then you're more infectious than others. But you know, I, I, I think it's that's also 
tissue dependent, like in the, na the nasal pharyngeal sure. cavity yeah. is a little bit different than saliva, than, than the bronchial mm -hmm. lavage, than uh, fecal samples. So there, there, there is some variance there, but I, I think, yeah, that's an area that I think is where the, the biggest optimization could occur is in nailing who's infectious with PCR or, or with rat tests because uh, the rapid antigen tests, uh, because that, that sharpens who's negatively impacted by positive tests that aren't infectious. You could even say, we'll, we'll be okay with a lot of false negatives uh, if we're catching, because if we're having everyone who can test at home. You can do it multiple times. Daily or whatever. Yeah. I mean, it'd be, right, it'd be a lot simpler. And then uh, you're, you're more likely to get, you're more likely to, to stop any sort of massive outbreak or spread yeah. if people can just do it at home. Yeah, right? it I mean, is. You, it don't, just, you don't have the headache of sense. having to go in and, and, uh, and wait. And, and actually, you brought up a really good point. I think there's a lot more false negatives than people may, may know. Everyone's talking about false positives because nobody likes this, the, you know, being falsely quarantined. But those swabs right. are known to be like, have like 30% false negatives. Uh, so yeah. there's a lot of people slipping through on, 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 the, uh, on the swabbing front. And that, that just leads to what you're saying is we should have the ability to do this like every 24 hours if we wanted to. If it were a pregnancy test like test, we, we would have, they'd be like 20 bucks instead of 200 bucks. And so you could yeah. take them, you know, every, every day for the course of your sniffles to know whether it's truly, you know, cold or whether it's coronavirus. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've talked to a surgeon just today and he's, I think he said he's been swabbed two dozen times because- he gets, you know, exposed at times or whatever. And, wait, wait. and so, yeah, he's getting the nasopharyngeal, right? Ah. And he's like, I can tell when it's not a good one. Yeah, it hurts. He said, I, you know, I, he, he said, I, I know when they're not up there. He said, when they're not scraping your brainstem, I know they're not far enough. And so yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> and, but to your point, that would, that would definitely drive up the false negative rate because it is not an easy test to, to test for yeah. right? when to do a nasopharyngeal swab. It, it's pretty aggressive. And I, I, I had a, I had like I almost got a sinus infection. Or I, I was, I had pain <laughs> for like a week after one of mine. Um, but only yeah, one, I'm sure. only one nostril. They're really aggressive in one and not in the other, you know, but they did go for both. <laughs> they double barreled me, which was, uh, impressive. That's, I think I'll just, we'll stop there. I, unless you have something else you want to add about the, uh, the PCRs with the SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, well, I would keep an eye out to, to address these questions. Some states are starting to, to put the CT values public. Uh, Rhode Island did this. Florida announced they're going to do it. I, I think that in general would help allay public concern over this because you could track public dashboards, not just qPCR positivity, but where the CQs are globally on these. So you can see that, okay, they're, everyone's getting a lot hotter and higher viral loads and everything's going down. And it also gives you a sense when, you, if you have them per amplicon or per target in the test, you can see when the population starts to drop one out. And, and that's a sign. It, it gives you more epi epidemiology information about the, 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 the scope of the pandemic. I think what happens right now with the tests is the scope of the pandemic gets broadened by the long tail of positivity. So, uh, you know, if you, if all these patients can be positive for another 60 to 90 days, the pandemic's really going to be over probably in February, but it's not going to look like it's over until uh, until May. You know, th there's going to be a lot of people that remain positive for a longer period of time when the pandemic's really burning itself out. Uh, and that may, you know, those two months of, of additional lockdown are, are going to have impacts that um, are just, I feel yeah. like that side of the equation is never really being spoken about. It's always about um, monomaniacal focus on, on, uh, on the pandemic and not the, not really any care is being paid to the cost of um, our reaction to it. And um, sure. that, that's, uh, yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm quite concerned about that. Just seeing what, what the estimates on, on, on the long-term effect of this from cancer uh, diagnosis. Oh yeah. I mean, all the other testing that's been, yeah. that was delayed. I mean, I think only just now have we caught up to all the MRIs that we delayed for six weeks in the spring. I mean, cause you know, that yeah. scanner is running full, full tilt all the time. And so you you slow down for six weeks. It takes a long time to get those back. And I think, you know, to your point about uh, false negatives and, you know, the, I guess the question would be like, well, how could you have a, fa a positive PCR COVID-19 swab, but not actually have it? And say, well, you know, if you're not a getting asymptomatic, but maybe you're symptomatic with like a regular cold, like we talked like a rhinovirus yeah. and now you get a PCR and oh, you're positive. Well, and so we think you had COVID, but is, maybe, is, maybe it's something else. Yeah. Right? That's the thing is there's a, this far as having so, so many people that are asymptomatic, there are co-infections in the data. I mean, there's really interesting work where they'd go and sequence all the RNA in patients and they do find co-infections. I think 3% of the patients in Chris May, Mason's work had influenza A and influenza B and a, and a few other rhinoviruses. And so you, you could be asymptomatic for SARS and have symptom, symptoms from one of the others. Uh, and, it, you know, and, and, and that kind of confuses things. So, um, 
that, that's, I think that's important when, I guess, when we're thinking about viral therapies, I imagine on your end, you, you, you may need to know because, uh, you know, ivermectin is different than, than Tamiflu. Uh, and, and it, you, sure. you know, you might, you might, I, I, I don't think they've, they've not been using Tamiflu. I know early on they were playing around with that, but I think ivermectin's probably shown itself to be a more rational, uh, drug for C-19. Yeah, I'm just an intubation monkey, so I don't really do. Uh, I don't. I'm not I doing. You see, when it's too late to matter. <laughs> so I, I take care. So like I said, I took care of the guy who had appendicitis. He came in. He was, didn't know he had a SARS-CoV-2. Comes in. He's test positive, and he was. Let me tell you, there's no question he had. He was actively infected with SARS-CoV because he had his saturation drop like a stone on induction of anesthesia, which is oh. typical someone who's like really sick or something like that, or someone who's got a viral infection. Because I've taken care of people with like the flu and you suddenly, and you do an anesthetic for them, for some reason you can't avoid doing it. And they will desaturate and they'll have, from respiratory syndrome, they'll be more compromised. Wow. He did fine and everyone, you know, usually people do fine, but it can be, you know, it can just be a little hairy. Are there other differential biomarkers like D-dimer or, um, you know, on Willowren factor, are these other things are they are they specific to, uh, specific enough to SARS that you can rely on those from the blood test or, uh, or does, not that we use. Yeah, I mean, I, I there, it's entirely possible that people are using things, but I, my pretty much my understanding is that we just use the PCR test yeah. really. And, and to your point about the quality of quantitative, you know, if you show cycle times, all I know is that what the cycle time is for a machine, but I don't know do. Do the, do the labs actually get a value of what the, the cycle time was? Like, oh, we saw it, it turned positive yeah. at 23. And so so they just never report that, but that's something they have internally in their labs. They could say, here in the in Grand Rapids in the last week, our cycle times for positives is about 22 and a half. And then three weeks ago, it was 28. So it's getting worse. Is, yeah, exactly. Is that what you're so kind the, of saying? The machines will come in defaulting to collect at least 40 cycles, but they usually the labs set the algorithm to, all right, call anybody under 37 positive, for example, even though they're going to yeah. read the machine out to 40 cycles, they're going to call. And the reason for that is you, you get, when you start to get a curve from PCR, it is this, um, it's, it's, it's literally like, uh, you've probably seen these kind of logarithmic curves and, yeah. and, and you need a couple cycles after it crosses the baseline for you to actually measure the slope of that curve. So something at 37 doesn't finish arcing off until 40. And you want to see that whole arc so that you're confident it's not just some weird noisy spike. Um, so the, they'll read them out longer than where they're actually going to call them. And, and ideally, they shouldn't be calling them past their limit, their measured limit of detection, which is attached to the assay. And I think the WHO just put out some guidance to make sure people are paying attention to the LOD on their test, because they do vary. And, and some people, if they just blindly set at 37, it, it won't transfer to another test as cleanly. But but yeah, so you could see that on population scale if, if they're reporting those. Uh, they usually just translate that information to plus minus and give it to the state. But Rhode Island's gone to the point of like, well, let's scrape all the CT values up to the public dashboards so that we can chart those. And you can, it's really interesting. You can see the segregations of the population that are uh, what percentage, I think in Rhode Island, it was something like 40% of the people were, uh, were above 35. And uh, that's 35 is a number that Fauci brought up as, as being probably, you know, you know, everything after is right. probably dead virus. So that, you know, 40% of the people are dead virus. Maybe they shouldn't be quarantining and maybe the, the, or maybe they could take a second test, right? Uh, you, you get a, a past a certain CQ, double check it with something else before you tell, go contact trace everybody and lock them down. Well, Kevin McKernan from, Medicinal Genomics. Thanks so much for being on The Paradox. Thanks, Eric. As a reminder, today's sponsor is the Alpha Coaching Experience. Act now to claim your spot in the spring enrollment before the doors close on February 22nd at midnight. There's no better time than now to make the change you know you deserve to be a better parent, partner, and physician. Enroll today at drpodcastnetwork.com slash alpha. That's drpodcastnetwork.com slash alpha. Thanks for listening to The Paradox. If you like what the doc is doing, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher and share the show with your friends. Become a supporting listener to get access to special bonuses at patreon.com forward slash the paradox. Show notes can be found at theparadox.com.